Welcome, everyone, to the Johnson County Task Force on Aging, um, our forum here today on June 12th, where we plan to talk about seniors, food insecurity, and gardens. The Johnson County Task Force on Aging is one of seven county task forces authorized by the Older Americans Act um, and serving through the Heritage Area Agency on Aging's Advisory Council. Um, so today we want to talk about um, some opportunities that we have in Johnson County. While seniors have many challenges as they age and manage their disabilities related to aging and other health issues, the common thread for over 91% of Iowa seniors is a desire to remain in their home and community of choice or to age in place, which is a term many of you have probably heard. One issue we'll discuss is how to improve access to healthy foods when seniors may not physically be able to manage their own garden plots any longer. Uh, in 2013, 9% of households containing seniors and 9% of seniors who lived alone experienced food insecurity. And according to Feeding America, um, it's not just a price issue. Health problems and lack of transportation mean that many seniors can't reach uh, their grocery stores and other sources of food, let alone afford to prepare their own fresh meals. So today, we want to discuss ideas around increasing access to fresh produce for seniors who want to remain in their homes, but lack the physical ability to manage their gardens and or access to farmers markets and other sources of healthy foods. Today, we've invited representatives from Grow Johnson County, Fred Meyer and Jen Cardos, um, as well as the director of the Parks and Recreation for Iowa City, Julie Seidel Johnson. Um, I, we do have a representative from Grow Johnson County who had a last minute emergency, was unable to join us, but he did send a statement, so I'll read that um, as we progress through. Um, Mike Carberry, who also serves on the Task Force on Aging and who is a um, supervisor with the Johnson County Board of Supervisors, has also served on the Johnson County Hunger Task Force. And so he was going to bring a little bit of insight to um, the issues directly related to seniors in Johnson County and how we can solution for them through these resources. So without further ado, I will go ahead and read the statement from Grow Johnson County about um, their organization and we'll move through um, for about three to five minutes through each of our representatives to talk about what they do, how they came about, and if they have some ideas um, about solutioning. And then I'll refocus us and then we'll talk about some specific solutions. So Grow Johnson County is a hunger relief and educational farm initiative focused on improving access to fresh fruits and vegetables and empowering a new wave of growers. Grow Johnson County aims to make good food available for all. They lease three and a half acres of land at the Johnson County Poor Farm on which they plant, cultivate, and harvest a variety of organic crops. These crops are donated to 10 local hunger relief agencies. This year, they added Elder, Elder Services uh, as another recipient agency. Elder Services plans to use the food that, that Grow Johnson County has donated for both their Meals on Wheels programs and their congregate dining sites. Grow Johnson County is excited to help improve healthy food access for aging neighbors. Um, with regard to the idea of co-opting senior home gardens, um, Grow Johnson County believes it could be a source of pride for an elderly person. Um, Any time that you have multiple garden sites spread throughout an area, it poses a logistical challenge. But with adequate funding and a dedicated volunteer base, it can be done. Grow Johnson County's uh, representative John Bowler envisions a friendly visitor program where volunteers stop by regularly to check on both the garden and the individual. Maybe the garden is initially set up by a group of volunteers, so MG, AmeriCorps, or community volunteers in general. And once the garden is established, it could be maintained by a friendly visitor. Um, come harvest time, perhaps the friendly visitor could prepare a simple recipe for the individual. Um, this method, method is very individualized approach that would yield greater results, but would be potentially a challenge to implement. But with funding, volunteer hours, training, and fuel, 
maybe a handful of AmeriCorps positions could be created specifically for such a program um, where they have a specific caseload of 10 seniors that they visit two or three times a week. Very interesting concept. So as we go forward, what John was addressing was um, the idea of um, seniors being that who have always gardened in their backyard or on their small farm a garden um, that are physically unable to work that land, set their garden up, plant, um, weed, and so on, as we know the maintenance that goes into gardening. But with often demand for garden plots for people that are city dwellers and don't have that opportunity, um, many of them go through uh, the parks and recreation and are get a spot at the community garden. Um, but it, for the ones who don't get the spot they want potentially, or there aren't spots available, this would be another opportunity to match them with available um, garden plots. Um, and that cooperative relationship between um, a senior or individual with disabilities who can't work it, but now they have someone who can. So they can benefit from the fresh produce that comes from the garden plus that relationship. So, Mike, would you go ahead and talk about the task force and some statistics specifically in Johnson County? Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Mike Carberry. I'm a Johnson County supervisor, uh, but I have been uh, a sustainability advocate uh, for about 15 years professionally before I uh, got onto the Board of Supervisors. So, um, sustainable agriculture has always been uh, uh, a priority for me. and. Um, in 2014, the uh, Board of Supervisors created the Hunger Task Force, uh, realizing that there were a lot of issues within the county that included poverty, affordable housing, transportation, um, hunger, all these different issues. But this hunger issue, we really had not uh, addressed specifically because we were doing uh, um, other measures to deal with some of those other issues. So created a hunger task force that was led by our social services director, Lynette Jacoby. And she uh, created this task force. There was a, a number of people uh, meeting for a, a few years. And then uh, the report came out um, in uh, spring of 2016, just a little over a year ago. Uh, the task force was broken into three committees. And I served on a committee that was called the Healthy Food Subcommittee, which was uh, really how do we get fresh and local vegetables and fruits into the system so those people that are uh, in need have better access to that, and uh, including seniors. And you know, there's a, so there's a great report, uh, the Hunger Task Force, you can find it on Johnson County's uh, website and download it that came out in February of 2016. Um, there's also some great information that was taken out of uh, the food insecurity among older adults. The full report came out in 2015 from AARP. Uh, there's all sorts of great information you can find on online. But one of the things that they found was, um, you know, poverty uh, among seniors in Johnson County is pushing close to 10%. Um, but we've also found that uh, almost 20,000 people in Johnson County are food insecure which means that they go to bed each night not knowing uh, maybe where their next meal is coming from and maybe they're hungry as well. So there was a lot of recommendations on how we address this and a lot of those have um, recommendations have been put into uh, reality. One of them was um, working out at using the Johnson County Poor Farm, our historic poor farm, which is a 160 acre historic farm uh, out on Melrose Avenue and using a portion of that to grow fresh and local food that, to be put into, um, into the food, local food system um, that could be distributed to uh, area agencies that provide meals or pantries or uh, that sort of stuff that could provide the food that, the fresh and local food that could help not only the people that are food insecure, but actually getting that fresh and local food into the system. So part of it, well, well is, grow Johnson County and they did uh, two acres last year and we've almost doubled the size of their acreage to three and a half and then we've also provided uh, 3.7 acres to a new group called Iowa Valley uh, Global Food Project and that is um, basically 3.7 acres of community farms 
community gardens, not farms. Uh, they're very, you know, smaller plots. And a lot of the people that have signed up for that are uh, people from immigrant communities. And they'll probably be growing a lot of vegetables that you cannot buy at farmer's markets, that you cannot buy at the grocery store. You can't get from a CSA. Native vegetables that will grow well in Iowa, but just aren't planted and grown on a local basis. And many of those folks from those immigrant communities are also uh, living in apartments. So they have the same issue of not being able to uh, have a garden spot uh, where they live. So those are just some of the things we've doing. Uh, some of the other areas uh, that we've addressed uh, um, with the seniors is that we're uh, distributing food uh, with a mobile food pantry and farm stands that can get food into what are called food deserts, areas of the community that are a couple miles possibly from the nearest grocery store. And I'm talking about a grocery store, not a convenience store. Most of the convenience stores do not have fresh and local vegetables. And um, so these are just a few of the uh, things that were addressed uh, in the Hunger Task Force. And I'm glad to talk about uh, community gardens later. And I, I really do like the idea that you were uh, addressing of uh, using the um, seniors' uh, guards. And it, it seems to be a very symbiotic relationship, people that need places to garden and people that have available land. Julie? So Julie Seidel Johnson, representing City of Iowa City as the Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, the main way that we are helping in these efforts are the City Council has a couple strategic goals that apply to the gardening programs, uh, working with sustainability issues and of course with the local foods economy. So we've been really lucky this past year, we extended our number of garden plots to we now have about 197 garden plots at four different locations throughout the city of Iowa City. Uh, those, all the plots were filled this year. Um, even with the addition of two new sites, we had every single plot taken, um, which is probably the first time that has happened in quite a while anyway. So we know there's a lot of interest out there in people wishing to garden for themselves. What we've noticed, and we notice this every year, is there's a number of people who are very excited to do their gardens, but lack some of the skills and some of the knowledge of how to do it. <laughs> if you tour our gardens right now, you'll notice it's very obvious who knows how to garden and who's learning and who's abandoned already at this point, uh, because you know it's just gotten out of hand already. So a new program for us this year was a new Learn to Garden program. It was a 12-week program um, that began back at the first of April. Um, it was targeted to low income and minority populations. And it was a free program which allowed 20 families to receive gardening kits, which included basic tools and a certain amount of seeds and plants to start their gardens. But more importantly, a 12-week class program with some ongoing coaching from a master gardener to help them learn how to garden. Very successful. The families that started have all stuck with it, and there's the, their gardens are some of the successful ones that we have out there. So for me, the interesting part uh, is also that this is for me a, a form of recreation. As a Parks and Recreation Department, we have a goal for everyone to gather here in our parks. We want people to come out of their houses, interact with their neighbors, do something good outside. And gardening really fits that role very well and makes good use of the land that we already have available. Um, what is lacking in some cases is that knowledge. People that are excited and want to garden, but it's their first time out, and they want to show their kids how to garden, but maybe they haven't had that experience before. So for me, this idea of possibly uh, moving some of the garden programs out to people who have been gardeners before and not physically able to do it may provide some of that mentorship for the new gardeners to actually learn and be successful in what they're doing. Um, as I mentioned, we have four current sites. We will likely have a fifth next year, but that doesn't mean that people have one close to them at all times, and that's one of the other requests that we get. Um, people that say, I really want a garden, but there's not one down the street from me, or it's, you know, it's a little bit of a drive to get to one of your garden sites. I think having more sites available spread out through the community would also provide that. So maybe it is actually a neighbor or someone you know, just down the street that has space and has a garden available. That's exciting to me. Yes. Fred, welcome. 
Hi, my name is Fred Meyer. I am the co-director of Backyard Abundance, and Jen Cardos will speak in a moment. She's the other co-director of Backyard Abundance. And Backyard Abundance is an Iowa City-based nonprofit, and we are an educational, environmental education nonprofit, and we help people create environmentally beneficial landscapes. An environmentally beneficial landscape can be one that uh, sequesters water through rain gardens. It can create wildlife and insect habitat for, say, bees and butterflies. And it can also be edible landscaping as well, whether that's a veggie garden or fruit and nut trees and berry bushes. We help people understand how to design and establish those spaces. And we do that through a number of ways. We do it through yard tours, finding folks in the community who have done, who have created a landscape that benefits the environment in some way. We do it through one-on-one -on -one landscape design consultations from very small backyards to huge acreages. And we give classes and presentations as well. Like Julie was mentioning, education is a big issue and we'll be talking more about that. I think we have some ideas about how we can overcome some of those hurdles. And we also develop publications, free publications, which are on our website. And then we also have been establishing educational landscapes, public educational landscapes around the community in partnership with, with uh, Parks and Recreation primarily to sh demonstrate all the possibilities that are available for people to garden in our community. And one of our specialties is, edu is edible landscaping. And we know that veggie gardening is one of the most high maintenance um, practices that we can do in our landscapes. And uh, I have a, a medium-sized veggie garden in my landscape, and I was out there just this morning sweating over you know, getting it watered and getting it weeded before the, uh, the sun came up. So that's one of the major challenges that we'll, we have to face with um, this notion of having people garden in other people's yards. And so I look forward to talking more about that. And I'm going to turn it over to Jen because she's going to talk a little bit more about some of the roles she plays with Backyard Abundance. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yeah, so I'm listening to the conversation here, and I'm intrigued about um, a couple things. So, besides my backyard abundance hat, so yeah, we, we are big, we're into backyard abundance, right? Growing abundant food and habitat for nature in the backyard. So, that's, that's our groove. Um, besides doing that, I also work as a health coach um, and in therapeutic horticulture. So I'm really interested in the wellness aspect of, of gardening and why we do gardening. So, um, so as Fred mentioned, I think one of our most successful recent projects in um, partnership with Julie is an outdoor classroom that's down at the rec center where we have a lot of raised uh, accessible beds that were built by local area high school students that grow um, all kinds of vegetables. Uh, so when we talk about edible landscaping, it's a lot of that is traditional vegetables. We have that. We also have fruit and berry bushes. Uh, but I, I think um, what I'm wondering about the aging population, the question that's m on my mind is we're saying, oh, these people can't work. Um, it's hard for them to work traditional vegetable gardening where you're getting down on your hands and knees, you're pulling weeds um, out in the heat. Um, I don't. And I think we, have, we do have a lot to learn, but I, as much as having somebody else garden on their land could be a thing, I really am interested in them still being able to continue to garden. Um, and what is it that we can be doing uh, to make it easier to garden? Because really, the traditional vegetable gardening is designed, it's modeled after tr agriculture out there, the way, way we grow corn and soybeans, which is machines do most of the work. Um, but Whenever we like, we're really into people-friendly garden, where you can use raised beds and um, you can sit on the edge of the bed and you can reach over and weed, and then you can um, go and sit in the shade. Uh, so when I think about the, I, I think there's opportunity. I do like the idea of people who want plots being closer, and I think that would work. But I, I think um, if it was my house and I had, um, I was once disabled for like a short period of time where I couldn't garden for about four or five months. I was on crutches and I had to hire somebody to do the gardening. And it was really, um, 
I was very sad. Uh, it was, it was, <laughs> it was, it was not good for me. Um, and so um, sometimes just the smallest things can make gardening easier. Raising the beds up can. Um, if you have arthritis, you can put like insulation from a pipe, pipe fitting um, around a handle just to make it more grippy. You can use different types of tools. So I think besides even the arrangements of, uh, you know, younger generation, older generation, um, just doing some adaptive tools so that people can continue to garden in their yards and figuring out what that is, what people really need to be able to do that is a big part of it. I guess the other thing I wanted to mention about if we want to engage, I don't know if it's necessarily youth we're talking about engaging, but if, um, if we're wanting to engage youth, uh, which we've tried to do in a lot of different ways in our volunteer base for all of our public edibles, um, the construction of beds um, is is where we find the kids are most excited um, and engaged um, and really proud of what they do. They seem to be more into that than pulling beads out of a traditional garden. So if I had some happy picture in my mind, we're having young people um, come in, um, learn building beds, maybe learning a school that's more financially beneficial to their future than pulling weeds. They're building beds, we're making it so that seniors can garden and they're easier their um, beds easier and maybe still also using the land in a more traditional vegetable way. So those are my thoughts. It reminds me of um, an op a potential for an opportunity for Project Lead the Way or some other um, STEM-based mm -hmm. um, groups at different high schools. Mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're making, so there are different funding uh, opportunities for ramp building for individuals um, who are in wheelchairs who now can't get into their home. And so there's mm -hmm. funds for ramp building. Mm -hmm. So there's potential for funding to be available for building raised garden beds, um, mm -hmm. particularly if you have volunteer labor and you're only needing to supply the materials. Um, and so as far as a project lead the way where they're also focusing on engineering, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's a, some thought that has to go into making a res raised bed and the right. amount of pressure on the wood and how far apart your supports are and so on and so forth because of the engineering involved in that and, and holding the, the um, um, earth material up higher. Um, so there's an opportunity for that. Just as Grow Johnson County um, suggested potentially for uh, AmeriCorps uh, Vista mm -hmm members as well. So I think we have all of the the moving parts in this county to make something like this happen. Um, it's just bringing them all together in a coordinated effort. Um, and so everybody's talking to each other and saying, yes, we're going to do this. And here's how my piece fits and so on. Very good idea. Another organization that has been around for a little while is called the Fab Lab, and they just found a permanent site. And one of their specialties is teaching people how to build things. They say that they can teach any, anyone how to build anything. And I was just in email, email correspondence with the founder this morning and asking him about this idea. And he said, yeah, this is exactly what we do. And so like Jen was saying, if we could find interested folks whether they're, it's youth or someone else that would be willing to build beds with some funding, um, I think we could get a lot of beds cranked out for those who need them. And, and coming up with specific sized beds and, and making sure that they're designed specifically for uh, the people that are going to be using them would be key. But that wouldn't be too difficult to come up with two or three different templates that would do that. And we've worked with the ACE Mentor Program, which kind of sounds similar to the Project Lead the Way, where um, that's how we got the beds built for, that we've been working on so far. So that stands for Architecture, Construction, Engineering, Mentorship Program. Yeah. And that's one of the number one comments that we get when people visit the edible classroom on the south side of the downtown rec center is they walk in and they ask, where can we get these raised beds made? Because not only are they beautiful, but they're really functional. Like Jen mentioned, it's, it's much easier to weed 
in these beds because you sit on the edge and you just reach across and, and you weed on them. They're also narrower beds as well. So we, we need to make sure that, uh, again, they're designed for the folks who are going to be using them. So if uh, it's children that are going to be using them, having a two foot wide bed is probably a good idea. If it's elderly or um, adults, th probably three or four feet wide so they can always reach into the middle of that bed. Um, I know my grandmother, she, like Jen said, I really don't think she wants to see somebody maintaining her garden space for her. This is something that she has been doing all of her life. And so what I do is I create, um, every year I go down to my grandmother's and I give her some um, pots full of tomatoes and set them on the edge of her porch. And that is her garden. And the rest of her garden, that, that was a large garden, has turned into a large flower garden that she enjoys looking at. And it's lower maintenance for her. She doesn't actually have to go out there and, and maintain it. And I think that's what most seniors, and most everybody, wants to have in their landscape. They want their landscape to work for them, not the other way around. We often, you know, our landscapes tend to tug at us, asking it, us to maintain them. And we, back here at Abundance, try and make it the other way around where our landscapes tug at us because we enjoy being in them. And so if we can design these landscapes for seniors and other folks so that it works for them and perhaps converting their old garden spaces into lower maintenance spaces that might provide, say, habitat for butterflies and bees and things like that, and then create these raised beds that are closer to their houses or creating containers that are closer to their houses that they can actually then um, successfully garden themselves, I think that's that's a key element to this being successful. It would be definitely an, an option. As far as providing food, when they don't have access to food, um, vegetable gardens um, that, so a, a, a compromise to that would be, or a way to do both, is to give them um, potted gardens closer to the home that they could maintain, mm -hmm. but also keeping that garden plot with producing uh, more vegetables and produce as well, then you're feeding the need for good food. So. One thing I, I think would be important would be do an individual assessment right. and find out what their goals are and say, okay, I'm a senior, I'm this old, and I can do this. And what, I, what I'd like to do is this. So maybe we can use, mm -hmm. there's a spectrum where, you, you know, they could continue to garden using raised beds and, and, and uh, container gardening and that sort of thing. But then, they, then there's also on the other end is, I still want to live in my house, but I am no longer able to do any gardening. Mm -hmm. But, and then also, I am a good gardener and I can mentor somebody, especially somebody that was coming in and that needs a little bit of help, that educational portion of it. So I think each individual household or garden would you could uh, kind of create a plan for it, mm -hmm. and that's where uh, some people with a little bit of expertise, maybe more than I, would say, okay, here's what we can do, and let's look at each individual case separately, and and not just uh, do the same thing in every in every garden. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. awesome. Go ahead. A another um, idea is we. We're in Iowa, right? We're all Iowans. We see tilled up cornfields and soybean fields all the time. So when we think about growing food, our first thought is veggie gardens, right? And like Jen was saying, we tend to take our vegetable gardens and, and replicate large scale farming on a small scale, which means just tilling up a plot and then going out there in the hot sun and watering and weeding. And we tend to shy away from that because it's not a lot of fun. And so we not only show folks how to design their gardens and establish their gardens, maintain their gardens in lower maintenance ways, but we also heavily promote perennials, fruit trees and berry bushes. Basically get those established once and once they're established, it takes about two, three years to establish those, then you basically just go out and harvest your free food for a long, long time. And just last night on the, on the Jen and I were um, maintaining the veggie gardens on the south side of the rec center, but afterward we actually went to the north side of the rec center where, where we established the Children's Discovery Garden in 2011. And there's two massive cherry trees out there, and we spent a good probably 20 minutes just filling up on sour cherries. And 
those and there's are, lots more. If anybody wants to make a pie, yeah. please come help yourself. <laughs> there's tons of them. And yeah. pretty soon the bush cherries are going to be available. And then the beach plums and the gooseberries and all kinds of other food that are out there. And so these are very low maintenance ways of growing food. And that's another idea is not just having people maintain the spaces, but come in and harvest the food in these spaces. So establish these perennial um, fruit bearing and sometimes ve perennial vegetables as well in these plots and then have folks come and harvest the food for the seniors or design the, the spaces in such a way that it's easier for the seniors to harvest that free food as well with very little maintenance. Yes. Sean, uh, this idea of um, using uh, a senior's garden in their yard and having other people uh, garden it and help them. This has been done in other places have, I've, that I've heard of. This is, we're not reinventing the wheel here. I don't know. Yeah, I think it has. Some, when, I, <laughs> when, I, when I mentioned this uh, program to other people, uh, they said, oh, that's being done this place, and, that, and I didn't write them down. But I think that, uh, as they say, we can use the Googles. Yes. And use and find out the uh, <laughs> find out best practices, uh, what other communities are doing, and find out what works and what doesn't. And then, what I uh, like to use is a, a a system called R and D is rip off and duplicate. Uh -huh. So we we take what works for them, we duplicate it, and then we put our Johnson County spin on it, and and and, and customize it to what works here using some of the great knowledge that we have from some of the people sitting up here and some of the other programs that are already here in Johnson County to come up with something that, that's workable, that's filling a need. And I, I, I look forward to maybe moving this forward into, uh, you know, I'm not sure we have to have a task force on this, but we could uh, uh, convene a committee with some stakeholders and see uh, if we could move this forward. That would be something that I would. Uh, I, I've got a pretty busy schedule, but I think I could. Uh, I could find time to sit on a committee that would would move this forward. That would be great. Do we have questions from the audience? Uh, suggestions? If you do, if you could come right up here to the podium, that would be awesome. Thank you, Janice. Thank you. I always wonder about growing vegetables and things like that. If we have low-income people, some people don't know what to do with them. Yeah. How about engaging people in recipes or, or actually showing people how to make use of some of these vegetables? I would agree. I think that's, there's a two-part to that. Um, and we do some of that through our farmer's market venue, trying to teach everyone how to use the different vegetables available at the market. So mm -hmm. definitely could be done through the gardens. Mm -hmm. But I think the other part comes with a number of our lower income folks are um, tend to be immigrant families. And it's not that they don't necessarily know how to use our vegetables. It's just that they're maybe used to different vegetables. So I mm -hmm. think allowing them or helping them figure out how to grow those here, too, might be a different way to attack the same issue. Or even using them as a resource to show us all how to make use of all kinds of new vegetables that we may not know about. Yeah, very true. Yeah, enhance our diets. Thought, Thank you. Too. Um, so the the educational gardens um, that we, so we're talking about education is an important thing, um, practice. So, uh, and we have the outdoor classroom. We wish we had a kitchen in there. Um, I have seen in Fort Collins, which is kind of a college town, or it is a college town similar to here, um, but they have some elements of what we have in the outdoor classroom, but then they have, they have an outdoor kitchen, mm -hmm. right? So they have a pl it's beautiful, and they call it the Garden of Eating, and they, um, and so people, and it's surrounded by raised beds of vegetables, and then people come out there and they do cooking demonstrations with the food, you know. So if there was, um, and I don't know, as far as uh, mobility issues, you know, there would be a lot to consider for targeting the senior population. But I do agree with you that that is a concern on all ages with so sometimes lower income. We At Weatherby, we have edible food forest out there. Um, and we grow a lot of these berries and perennial crops, and we find that those families um, don't have a relationship to that type of food. You know, maybe they've, there's been generations where nobody's gardened, and their main relationship is with things that are in boxes. And so, we hold harvest parties out there where we just make smoothies, and we have them harvest things from the garden, 
and then we bring in, you know, some bananas too to make them um, uh, not so tart um, for those tartar fruits. But that's that's becoming more and more popular every year. And we're going to bring in those mobile food stands with um, Field the Family this year uh, to again demonstrate with chefs how to prepare the food that we're giving away. Because we run out of food at the harvest party actually right now. Um, and so. Well, I, I think the education is so important. Um, I remember the first time I uh, joined a CSA, Consumer Supported Agriculture, where I would get a basket of food every week. Mm -hmm. And there were sometimes vegetables in there in my basket that I had never seen and I could not identify. <laughs> yes, well, even the first time I saw kale, I said, what is this? And, uh, you know, and, but the, uh, the farmer that had provided that basket also included some recipes, mm -hmm. especially, you know, I know what to do with carrots and leaf lettuce and things like that. I make salads of them and then I can, you know, make stews and stuff with the carrots, but I didn't know what to do with kale. And I said, do I cook it? Do I eat it raw? You know, what do I do with this? And I think that, uh, especially if you're dealing with vegetables that are uh, not common or fruits that are not common to uh, our Midwest diet, that that providing the information on and on how to prepare and, and what it's used for, I think, is, is very important. Okay. We have another question. My name is Bob Welsh. Uh, Fred and Jen, this, I uh, wish I'd known about this two months ago because <laughs> uh, I just planted a, uh, a tree, not a fruit tree, never even occurred to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I'm optimistic how long I'm going to live, but uh, <laughs> thank you for that. Um, I had written down, Mike, before your comment about your willingness to get together the stakeholders for implementation uh, was, is the Hunger Task Force still an active group? Uh, or do you need to redo that or convene the t stakeholders? I do believe um, it's no longer functioning. Um, once we re uh, did, did the report, uh, uh, came out in February of 16, I know I, we haven't had any meetings. Uh, my, um, my group, um, the Healthy Foods uh, subgroup, just put on a community dinner here at the Coralville um, Public Library on Friday night. So that was one of the things that we did was community dinners and we uh, fresh and local foods and then we've, they must have fed 500 people here on, uh, on Friday night. Uh, the first time we did it two years ago was about 100. They doubled it and I think they doubled it again. And so it's, you, you have a community dinner and a lot of people coming out, it's very, very popular. Free food will bring in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think it would, uh, this, a project like this would uh, in, entail the whole task force coming through, but just a few stakeholders. Um, you know, there was a lot more stakeholders, the pantries and uh, everything else and involved in the original hunger task force and, and elder services and you name it, uh, groups that, uh, uh, dealt in in food in in the community and especially for for low-income folks But I think that uh, it would be a smaller group. So I think it would be easier to convene um, a committee of stakeholders and uh, You know, I, I don't think you know, we might be able to pull it together uh, This summer and fall and winter and something like this might be able to be ready for next growing season if you if you got it on the ball who would be in the best position to secure the VISTA worker? Um, any 501c3 can um, make their organization available for placement for AmeriCorps VISTA. Um, and so, but if you were to convene a, um, a task force or focus group or however you want to call it, committee. a committee, um, but with, with the specific um, goals, that in a time frame, um, because the biggest thing is having the organizations together. You can write a grant for funding so that you can uh, potentially maybe hire someone to coordinate this, to coordinate a learning and an individual assessment and so on and so forth and pairing uh, people. So maybe it's a need when all the organizations come together to say, you know what, this each of us could have a part in this um, opportunity and with the right funding, um, you know, we can, because I think that it would, 
it would be more successful to have a focused point person to take it on and then determining out of the organizations who's in the best position to um, parent it in coordination with other organizations. Fred, Jen, how much does it cost to build a raised garden mm -hmm. that's for a senior? Yeah, that's a very good question. It really depends on the size of the raised bed. And it's interesting that you ask that. We actually have a publication that's available for free on our website. So free publication on our website that has a um, those exact costs in it. And so you can go to our website and it's right on the front page and download it. But usually a small raised bed, if it's if you're not counting labor for constructing it, if it's made of cedar lumber and it's stained appropriately and is lined with some landscape fabric to preserve it, it's gonna be around 300 bucks, 300, 350 bucks, something like that. Now that's just for the materials. Actually constructing it'll probably be more if you hire somebody to do that. That's for you know a medium size, probably it's the size of this table, something along that line. And that would have that lip on it and be a really nice thing to, uh, and, and that includes all the soil and everything as well. And that would be an easily maintainable bed. Because my guess would be that there would be people who would be willing to write a check for $300. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, we've worked some... Uh, and some lumber companies are willing to donate costs, but also, yeah, I, we find in general fundraising to get people to help um, pay for supply costs is sometimes easier than the labor costs mm -hmm. for as anybody who has a nonprofit kind of knows. Yep. And so, um, yeah, I, have, I think you're right that there probably be people willing to help fund that. I'd always have to check with my wife, but I would yeah. think that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and. and $350 is about the cost of a ramp to build a ramp for uh, for uh, an individual with a wheelchair for the materials, not the labor, um, just the wood. And, and Julie, I know from my son and granddaughter, each of them have one of your plots. Uh, and I gather that you had more people asking for them than you had. I would say this year we, we just about hit supply and demand equal. So okay. we did sell out all of our plots, um, but we've had a few asks afterwards, but um, we actually added about an additional eight plots to, to accommodate them. Uh, that being said, we still have more space. We Now that we know there's more demand, we have more space for plots too. And I'm, am I right that uh, if Mike gets this going, with a stakeholder group that you'd be able to refer people, you know, like my granddaughter and her husband, just really enjoying uh, their plot. Uh, and I know, I, I sort of gathered they could only get one plot. Correct. That's a good point. That we, because of the supply and demand, each person generally only gets one plot. So there are people that would like more spaces. That this could be a, a, a bonus for them as well. Yeah, so if so. Mike gets this going, you could <laughs> tell people uh, like Mike. Bob, I'm just the idea man here. Oh, okay. Uh, no, okay. I mean, uh, no, I like. Uh, oh, Bob is always good at squeezing shoes to get things done, and. Um, I would glad to be part of it. I don't know no. if I have the bandwidth to no. uh, to do all the convening because actually this was <laughs> Sean's uh, idea to move forward. So I think she's volunteering to uh, oh, yeah. to, <laughs> to lead this effort. Um, but uh, but well, I guess live, all I'm yeah. saying is it yeah. seems to me that yeah. people working together oh, yeah. uh, could do this. And, Many uh, hands make for light work. And uh, yeah. I've, I've been around a long time, and I really didn't know... Uh, Fred and Jan of your organization, uh, and appreciate that opportunity. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm a huge fan of pilots and celebrations. And so if we can do some sort of pilot with maybe two or three landscapes mm -hmm. where we design these types of spaces, like you were saying, you nailed it, Mike, having a, a consultation with these folks to find out exactly what works for them in their landscape, mm -hmm. design it for them, maybe with some raised beds, maybe with some perennial crops, maybe with some conventional veggie gardens that are being maintained by grandkids or neighbors or something along that line. And then it'll open it up for a yard tour. 
And in addition to the yard tour, have a cooking demonstration or something like that. One of our uh, programs that we're helping oversee is called um, Edible Outdoors. And they are fantastic at doing celebrations. So just this weekend, they had a mushroom foray where you go out and forage mushrooms, but then they teach how to actually prepare those mushrooms. A few weeks ago, they had a foray where they went out into urban spaces and harvested just weeds and showed you how to cook up dandelions and plantain and other medicinal and uh, nutritious weeds that were in a landscape. It's always in the context of celebration, right? And I think that's what can really hook people and reel them in is if we put these, this in the, in the idea of uh, in just a celebratory uh, way, then uh, we're gonna get more people in. And again, the pilot, piloting as well. I, uh, I'll sit down, but uh, <laughs> when you have your stakeholders together, if you take up Fred's idea of pilot project. Oh, yes. Uh, I think I can speak for my wife. We'll, uh, we'll fund one of your first oh, pilot projects. Oh, fantastic. Okay? Write that down, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> we got him on tape. Yeah, exactly. No, I, uh, I like the pilot program uh, idea. I think it's, uh, you know, start small so it's manageable. Um, what I also like about is what Fred was talking about, celebration, and to me it's about community as well. I live across the street from uh, uh, Chattanooga Green Park, and I've been watching the, uh, uh, the community gardens there grow. I think this is the third year there. I believe so. Yeah, and it's grown a little bit every year, and uh, one thing I'd like to see in our community gardens is, is actually more community space. Um, there's a picnic table out there, one picnic table. I'd like to see a shelter out there. I'd like to see uh, in community gardens, and, and, and this is drifting a little bit from our focus here on seniors, but the community that you were talking about and the celebration of food and the celebration is, is very, very important. And so if we do this, uh, this project, we move forward, uh, you know, sharing the meal with the people that are helping grow the food with those seniors, not just giving them the food, but why not help them prepare that? Why not sit down and have a meal with them? Mm -hmm. I would I would love to see things like that. And then I, and like I was saying at, at, at Chattanooga Green Park and maybe some of the other community gardens, to incorporate even a little bit more park-like atmosphere that encourages people to stick around. Mm -hmm. Once they've watered and tended and things like this, we'll hang out a little bit and maybe share some of the food that they've grown and maybe exchange some of the food with some of the other growers and uh, and maybe have um, not weekly, but uh, a monthly thing at, at this go uh, community garden where you actually have a little event where everybody that uh, is in that community garden is encouraged to come on a particular night and bring something that they grew in their garden as a kind of a potluck or, or uh, to, to make it more of a community. Uh, I, I would see that the, uh, these community gardens become even more part of our, our culture here in Johnson County and not just a, a 10 by 10 spot where someone grows some vegetables. Well, and in addition to, if they only get one plot where you're at, um, you know, potential evolution of this is to do a coordinated effort. Maybe family A does all tomatoes and family B does all peppers and then they come together and they make salsa. You know, family C does the cilantro and the garlic. You, do you see what I'm saying? Um, for, for us, we do share, um, we have, um, you know, we have a 400 square foot garden and my husband is meticulous about it. Um, but we have over 40 um, cabbage plants because I make the sauerkraut, so he grows it, I prepare it, um, and then we trade with other families um, our, you know, our specialties. And so that way we can maximize what we do best in our garden, but we and allow the other family to do that. But we're not missing out on some of the products that we want. So another way. Yeah, what a great way to to meet your neighbors, right? Let's get these. <laughs> veggie gardens into our front yards, right? Where we can see people gardening, right? What else do we do with our front yards other than mow them? What a fantastic way to meet your neighbors is to uh, just tend each other's plots and then come together and celebrate and make salsa and make sauerkraut. Yeah, so it can be a great community endeavor, neighborhood building endeavor. For sure. 
Fred, does that, there used to be an organization, and I think it was in the area uh, called Food Not Lawns. Mm -hmm. Does that uh, organization still exist? Uh, that was around probably six or seven years ago, right. and um, I was with that group for a yeah. little while, and I don't think it's 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 around anymore. But isn't that what they but, were encouraging? Right, was that, that was... front yard gardening instead of, you know, so front yard abundance? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm a huge proponent of that. Yeah. But again, it all gets back to what you mentioned before, yeah. finding out what works for the homeowner, whether yeah. it's a senior or otherwise, but trying to get people to just uh, learn about all the opportunities that our landscapes can provide for us. Like Bob, you mentioned you never even thought about planting maybe a fruit tree or berry bush in your landscape. And so many people are not aware of the tremendous amounts of food that we can grow in Iowa, that we once grew in Iowa. Like right now, June berries are coming on, and they're all over Iowa City. They're also known as Saskatoons or service berries, and they're often planted as ornamentals because they're gorgeous. Multi-stemmed shrubs, they produce delicious little purple berries that are edible and very nutritious. They're right on the Pentacrest, actually, between the uh, Old Capitol Mall and Old Capitol, so go out and harvest those service berries. But, but people are not aware that those are edible. And uh, that's just one of a few berry bushes that we can easily grow in our climate. I have a quick question for Backyard Abundance. Do you go outside of Johnson County? Yeah, most of, uh, probably 80% of our work is here in Johnson County. But yeah, we um, just uh, this weekend, we were in Grinnell teaching a class called Maximize the Harvest. And it actually focused on veggie gardens, low maintenance veggie gardens. Awesome, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? If we don't, um, I'm going to thank everyone for coming today and starting our discussion, and hopefully we can continue it beyond here. Um, if anyone who's watching this has any questions um, regarding the information here today or these organizations, I'm sure that Eric is going to um, put up the website for them right now. There we go. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for participating today. And um, hopefully, we can continue our conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank Sean. you. Thank you.